Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson. Thanks for checking out the podcast here on YouTube. Be sure to hit the subscribe button and the notifications bell. You'll get a notice anytime we upload some new content. And when I'm not asking Bruce, hey, how big was Batista's? Well, you know. One of the things I like to do is help people save money. And if you're watching this video right now and you're in a 30 year loan, man, you're overpaying your single biggest bill and you may not even realize it. I want you to do a little experiment for me. Take your calculator out, multiply your monthly house payment by 360 payments. That's how many payments there are in a 30 year loan. That big scary number, that's your total of payments. You're looking at that number? You know you can do better. Keep more of your own money right now and go to savewithconrad.com. Or maybe you've got credit card debt. Man, it's not a matter of if I can save you money with that. Your average interest rate on a credit card is more than 20%. And by the way, all the interest you pay on those credit cards, it's not tax deductible. Whereas the mortgage interest, well, that is tax deductible. So if you owe this debt, it's up to you how to pay it back. Doesn't it make sense to get the cheapest rate possible and the greatest tax deduction possible? Find out how much money you can save right now for free at SaveWithConrad.com. You don't need perfect credit, even scores in the 500s can be approved, and it's no cost out of pocket. But maybe best of all, we're licensed in more than 40 states. We can help more families than ever before. But how much can we save you? Find out right now for free with a quick quote from SaveWithConrad.com. Hello and welcome to Grilling JR. This is Paul Bromwell and I'm joined by the voice of wrestling, Mr. Jim Ross. Jim, how you doing this week? Oh, good, man. Good. I'm all checked up on uh, diet Snapple. Jim, look, me and you yeah, both, buddy. I'm, I'm a big diet Snapple guy, man. Yeah, me too. I got one too, man. That's funny. I have, uh, I must burn out on the diet peach, but I still like it. This is the half and half. Okay. The Arnold Palmer. In other words, Donald Arnold Palmer, they yeah, can't say. Very nice. I got a little raspberry tea. So I got the variety pack. There you go. Variety pack. Spice a lot, they say. Yep. Uh so er everything's good. You know, I think my uh, cancer treatments are still ongoing. Uh by on let's see, Friday. This Friday I will take my fifteenth uh radiation treatment. So every morning I go to, uh, about a 30 minute drive and it's longer to get there than it is for the treatment, mm. which is not a bad thing. But the problem is that the more radiation your skin endures, the more inflamed it gets, the more tender it gets, uh, it's very delicate to the touch. So, you know, you gotta be aware of what you wear. It's crazy as hell. And I thought, well, this will, it'll get better pain wise. I could, the pain will be more manageable as I go into the process, but that's not the case. So, uh, because and if you stop and think about it, it's logical. They're burning your skin around the cancer and it's in my ankle. There's not a lot of muscle or fatty. It's just on, it's on the ankle area. So it's just skin. And, uh, so anyway, that's been a, that's been a little problematic, uh, you know, keeps me from sleeping all night, things like that. So it's, I'll be glad to get it over with. Uh, and then once they stop the radiation, they'll stop, they'll stop aggravating the skin and all that good stuff. So that's kind of where I am on it. You know, I'm optimistic. I, I believe that I'm going to be just fine. You know, I'm, I'm on target to, uh, return to, uh, work, hopefully knocking on wood as I just am, uh, on the, uh, dynamite of, uh, this coming back to Daly's place in Jacksonville. I think it's on the 29th, the, the, uh, that Wednesday night there. So I, that's what I'm hoping to do. And it seemed like it worked out pretty uh, like meant to be because I don't have to fly anywhere. I can just drive over there and do my gig, you know, and, and call the matches. Uh, and I really miss that calling matches. Uh, that was my, that's, it's always been the most fun part of my career is broadcasting. And then along the way, I got involved in other things, but nonetheless, uh, that's the fun part as they say. So that's where I am. You know, I'm not in the fun part of this, uh, mm. radiation treatment, but it, I got to go through it. I got to do it. So I don't look at it in, a, in a, any way other than this is my, I have an option. Well, I have two options. I have an option to be a man and get it done and endure. 
or I can say, I, I can't stand it. And I'm going to, I'm going to bolt for treatment, take my chances. So I, I don't plan on doing that. So I, that's that my dad told me a long time ago that quitting is the easiest thing in the world to get good at. And I believe that. So I ain't quitting. And so we'll be fine. So it's all good though. You know, business at the bar at the uh, website's good. Appreciate everybody that's checking it out and, and giving us a little business here, there, and yon. Uh, we have great stocking stuffers, we believe. And, uh, so it's, it's all good. You know, uh, business has been good at jrsbbq.com and you know, we're working around the clock out there. I, I get books shipped from our little warehouse in Norman to Jacksonville beach. And I'll get, you know, six, eight cases of books. And I sign and inside, you know, my, uh, uh Stephen link runs it always has a little stick them in there. This is to Paul or whatever. And, uh, or what they want to say. So I, I'm, uh, still been doing that. I enjoy that. It takes my mind off the bad stuff. You know, when I get a report, Hey, we had a good sales day. Hey, great. Good for us. The home team won. We win one. So it's good. So anyway, that's kind of where we are. Uh, I'm just trying to spend more time on the website, uh, as vis-a-vis, -vis, uh, worrying about my you know, doing more research on, uh, uh, skin cancer. Mm. I got buddies. They're so anal. They'd be reading about this shit forever. Mm. They'd, like they're going to take a, a, a test to become a doctor. And I, I, I just do the opposite. I, I step away from it, man. I, I have experts that are monitoring me daily. Well, Monday through Friday, I figure they know more about that than I do. Now, if they want to start talking wrestling or something, I think I could probably keep up with them, but, uh, I'll just let them, uh, you know, they, they're, they're, they're doing it for my, my best interest and they know how badly I want to heal. So anyway, that's, that's my life in a nutshell, go get treatment, run my little, uh, you know, errands, which includes breakfast at my new favorite place. Uh, another new, another new favorite, uh, the, uh, Jacksonville beach. Uh, brunch Haas, H A U S it's on third mm. street, about two blocks from where I live. And it's fa fabulous because it's exactly what you've been visiting at the, your favorite bar. They know your name. I feel like Norm when I walk in. Right. So it's, it's good. It's, it's fun. So you like that. I migrate to those places, but other than that, man, I'm in a, I might be in a, uh, what's that grocery store chain. It's pretty good. Uh, starts with a B a Publix. Oh, Publix. Okay. Yeah. I'll go to Publix. I got a Publix just right here or on the beach. So theoretically, if I'm smart and there's been discussions of whether that's true or not, uh, I would say I have my little cocoon I live in and I rarely get outside of it. So, but, uh, I got time to do a good show here tonight though. I think that this is going to be good. Uh, a very interesting show. It, it, it is Jr. but I got to ask, you said your yep. new favorite breakfast place. Do you have a good, what's your, do you have a go-to order when you, when you go in, do you have, no, a, you know, they got, I've, I've had, uh, the first thing I ordered there was, uh, uh, they're, they're especially it lo looks to me like is our Benedict's. Okay. So today I had a sirloin Benedict chopped sirloin steak prepared just like you would eggs Benedict with a piece of ham in it or something. The first thing I ordered there, cause the bartender told me it was really good, uh, was, uh, corned beef, uh, or yeah, corned beef hash, corned beef, uh, corned beef Benny. And then I've had a ham Benny and the lady sitting beside me at the bar today had the sirloin chopped sirloin, uh, Benedict, and it looks so damn good. I couldn't resist not ordering it. So I asked her if it was good. And, uh, she, she gave it praise. So I, I gave it a shot. I've had a uh, Reuben sandwiches there or not root. Yeah. Reuben and Cuban and BL homemade BLTs that they mm -hmm. do come, especially the house. One of my weaknesses is damn BLTs. Yes. Kill me. Uh, so, uh, and they have great, uh, cream gravy and homemade biscuits. Whew. Oh yeah. Talk, I'm dying. I'm, I'm loving this place. You're talking my love language now, Jr. Come on. And I can, I can, I can walk there. You know, if I was on, an, on one of those days where you wanted to drink, but, uh, you know, their hours are unique. They're like all those breakfast places. They're open at six, eight in the morning or something like that till two. I know they're open till two. 
So that's what, uh, that's some, but I'm trying a lot of things on the menu, man. I enjoy that. I love it. And the longer I can sit there and shoot the shit with people and, uh, just talk about things other than me and skin cancer or things like that. Uh, take a selfie or shoot the breeze or whatever. It's always good. It's always good. It's a, it's a good medicine for me. Good. Well, good, JR. I'm glad to hear that you're occupying yourself, preoccupying yourself with things like breakfast out, like signing you your books, focusing on all the right things, getting better. And I know, you know, like you said, you could sit out there and read all the stuff online and man, that'll take you to the end of the internet. Just oh. if you're starting to do that and you don't want to do that. So oh. I'm, I'm glad you're uh, doing all the right things and a lot of people and you're, and you know, you're in their thoughts, their prayers. And, uh, I'm just glad to hear that treatments are going well. And man, we're hoping yep. to see you back in, at dynamite on the 29th. And that's, uh, a, that's yeah. a plan. There's no guarantee. Let's not get carried away that <laughs> I'm not guaranteeing I'm going to be there because I can't control the issues that would allow the guarantee to happen, but that, well, you gotta have a plan. That's right. You gotta have a destination or you, or how do you get there? You don't even know where you're going. So you gotta have a destination. You gotta have a plan on how to arrive at that destination. That's what we think we've done. So unless something pops us, rears this ugly head between now and then that's, uh, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. Well, we're all cheering for you in that way. As we record this, this is the day before uh, the 16th when this drops on the main feed. And it's also just a few hours before the winner is coming AEW Big Show. You and I are going to check that out right after this recording. So big show tonight for AEW. We'll yeah. see how that one goes. But that's, that, uh, that, that, yeah. D Daniel Bryan, Bryan Danielson, shall I say. Uh, and uh, Hangman Adam Page is an interesting story within the match. Now the match has not happened. It's going to be on live. We're, as you said, we're recording a few minutes earlier than that. So we can both watch the show. Uh, and, but man, I'll tell you the, uh, this is going to be an interesting thing for hangman page. Uh, he's got a chance to really, uh, raise eyebrows, create maybe a different perception for him as the guy with the ch championship, the top title in the company wrestling on a main event on a primetime television show, all these things. And, uh, and I know he had this run with Kenny and, and the tags. Uh, there's no doubt that Paige doesn't have a lot of talent, but when you're there by yourself and you're defending the title, uh, against a very well-respected and dangerous physical challenger, I don't give a damn who you are. There's gotta be some nerves. So my point in this is that, uh, it's all uh, the quality of this match will solely depend on how hangman handles his nerves. And that's not a knock at hangman. And if he wasn't nervous and it just, oh, it's okay. It's another match I've had, you know, I've been working six or eight years, whatever, whatever it is. Well, that's not the attitude to have. So uh, I'm looking forward to the whole show, but that match alone uh, is going to be interesting and, and I'm sure they'll be given plenty of time to tell their story. Uh, I think that's good. Then the MGA M MJF wrestling tonight is another, I don't want to say oddity, but it's, it's rare. Mm. I think Tony Khan's booking MJF perfectly because he's not overexposing him and he's keeping him fresh. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, Max is really great at keeping himself fresh because Max loves Max. And I don't blame him. If he ain't got his own back, who does? So he's, uh, he's just very, very smart. Let me tell you this statement of the night may be that, uh, MJF is a, is a younger, actually athletic version of Paul Heyman. Mm. And I've been, hey, look, I was around Paul Heyman when he was in his twenties, uh, a lot. And, uh, you know, I helped Paul a great deal back when nobody wanted to work with him because he was so obstinate in their view. Well, I saw talent and was he a pain in the ass? Absolutely. And, uh, but he was our pain in the ass and he was my pain in the ass partner who made both of us better. So we did some good work in WCW before we ever got to WWE. I, I, I always thought I enjoyed it. I can tell you that. So, uh, Max is a young Paul Heyman only with muscles and athletic ability. So that just tells you where he ranks in my lexicon of, uh, 
uh, some of the smartest guys ever been around in pro wrestling. And the thing about it, he's in his mid twenties. Yeah. So hopefully he won't ever self-destruct and get, oh, I got this. I got this. I don't need to get any better. That's bullshit. So, uh, but I, he and I've had some really good talks over the, over since our tenure there at, uh, at AEW. I always talk to him every TV and we, we chat about different things. He asks questions that are intelligent questions. So, you know, he's thinking about things that are spot on because of the questions that he asks or the subjects that he wants to discuss. So it's an interesting, uh, I look for different stories. These matches, how is max going to lead this match tonight, uh, against one of the hot young baby faces, uh, how is, uh, how's, how's hangman going to hang, uh, handle his pressure and how aggressive is Brian Danielson willing to be to continue that role that he's on because he's put together a string of matches against a, a opponents of the different skill levels and all that stuff. He ain't had a bad match. He is not Daniel. He, uh, Brian Daniels has not had a bad match. Yeah. Hey folks, it's time to take your podcast game to the next level. And you certainly want to get your almighty push. My God, we have to have a push, right? We'll get that over at adfreeshows.com. Now I'm telling you, if you're a fan of grilling, JR adfreeshows.com has the entire episode library and it's got no ads. Zero ads, zilch, none. Ad free and on video starting at just nine bucks. Did you hear what I, what I said? Nine dollars. You spend more than that at Starbucks, for God's sakes. Two mornings. If that's not all, folks, we've got tons of bonus content, including my after hours round table where drinking was involved with Eric and Tony. You simply will not find a better value in all of wrestling. Hey, look, don't make me go red ass because by God, you know, I will hurry over to adfreeshows.com right now and sign up. And I thank you. So anyhow, could end up being the wrestler of the year, but Jr. high praise from you for MJF with the comparison to Paul Heyman for sure. So, uh, man, good stuff. Looking forward to that tonight, but let's jump into what we're here for. And, uh, man, we're coming down to the last few episodes of the year for grilling Jr. and you and Conrad and me from time to time have really taken a deep look into, uh, to 2001, uh, this year and what a year it was in wrestling. You had ECW closing down WCW being bought by the WWF. You had nine 11 and everything that entailed that. We talked in detail about the year Chris Jericho had. We did Chris Jericho 2001 together. That was a, a fun show. And everything in between, JR. And today, we're putting a bow, a bow on the whole year. This is the 20-year look back as we discuss the final pay-per-view of that year. It's WWF. That's right. They were still F, Vengeance. And, uh, JR, it wasn't always called Vengeance. It was historically called Armageddon, but because of 9-11, the pay-per-view was renamed to Vengeance. Do you remember anything in terms of the decision-making that was going on around that in terms of the rebranding and changing over to Vengeance? And was this it a was marketing? Needed. Yeah, it was, it was, it was marketing, uh, PR, uh, whatever you want to say, whatever word you want to use. It was just a better way to present the show after the the tragedies of nine 11. And we were very involved in, in the nine 11, uh, situation as far as recognizing it, honoring the, uh, the first responders and all those type things. Uh, I think it's a smart move. And I don't, and I don't know that anybody had any resistance whatsoever. Cause let's be honest about it. Armageddon didn't have like WrestleMania name identity, right? It was just another gimmick name. And so if you can make it better, then why not? Well, we're two, act, two weeks out from the historic episode that you and Conrad covered where you joined Vince McMahon's Kiss My Ass Club on Raw. You have uh, that reset. You have Austin's baby face turn. Flair is hired. Taker's heel turn. There's a lot going on in terms of building up the pay-per-view, and it almost feels like it's a throwaway segment that the two titles are going to be merged and create one unified champion. Did you agree with that approach? It feels like it's just another kind of storyline thrown in there. I, I don't like too many titles because 
well, well, the more titles, the, the more they're watered down or can become watered down. It's not always the case. It's like having two world champions. I, it doesn't make sense to me. Mm. Uh, and I think more titles means more, uh, I don't know, it just, I can't, it's a hard time to give them the clout, the credibility they need if they're competing in their own company with other champions or the same title, the same level of right. accomplishment. Just, I don't get it, but nonetheless, uh, no, I, I think that was, that was a, if anytime you can consolidate and then we'll, we'll look, reevaluate what you have left as far as the championships and make those better. You've done your company a very good, uh, something very good. And I think that's what the intent was with that situation. Well, we talked through this again in the Chris Jericho episode, and we all know Chris wins the title at the end of the show, but out of the four people in that picture, Jericho, Austin, rock and angle. Was he the one you thought should be leaving that night with the belt? Jericho? Yeah. Well, here's, I'll look at it this way. Considering I, I recruited and signed every one of those guys. I have a different relationship, a different view than an educated fan even would. Cause I have a different relationship with them. It's been built over time and trust and, and discussions and all these things. Uh, Austin didn't need it. He could always get it. Rock is going to be his schedule is getting iffy because of all of his other things he could do and, and was doing. So it comes down to me then to angle and Jericho logically. So, because everybody can ask the same question and probably would ask the same question. Does rock need it or does Austin need it? No. Well, who needs it the most? And so I think Jericho was the guy that needed it the most. Kurt's Kurt's, uh, is just a natural made. He was just, he's a superstar. Mm. So I, I look at it this way. I don't know that Kurt angle needed it because you know, he's going to get it. So let's put him on a little journey to get there. But, uh, so I, I, I like the decision of Jericho. Well, Jr. recently on the Kurt angle show, which by the way, part of our family of shows here, cheap plug over at adfreeshows.com. This made all the headlines recently as Kurt shared this revelation. And I want to get your thoughts on it. So take a listen to this clip. The first thing was, you know, the week before the pay-per-view, I was still supposed to be undisputed champion. Vince McMahon had me picked as the undisputed champion. He wanted me to win the, the two titles. And uh, Vince came to me uh, the week prior to the pay-per-view and said, listen, is it okay with you if I give it to Jericho? Because um, uh, I want to start pushing Jericho, and I think this would be great for him. And I said, no, Vince, you, sh you should do that. I think Jericho needs it. And this is a great opportunity for him. But so I was supposed to win the undisputed championship, but Vince McMahon changed it at the last second and gave it to Jericho. Do you but think about that? Now, yeah. you take that? Just take that statement out of context and, and look at it a couple different ways. Uh, Vince McMahon took it from me. I don't like that, uh, terminology because the intent of this bite, and it was a very honorable bite by, by Kurt was that Vince talked to him about it. He didn't have to explain to him why he's changed his mind. And, uh, it's not against the rules to change your mind in this business. So, uh, I think that I agree with Chris, I agree with Kurt Jericho needed it more than the other three guys. That's why I got it. Do you remember any of that discussion back then that Kurt refers to? Were you a part of that at all? Uh, of yeah, of course I was, uh, I'm not going to. You know, like I said, I, I have a different perspective than you would or Conrad would or somebody else, because you didn't recruit them. You didn't, you didn't sit with them and, and counsel them and, and mentor them and, and develop a relationship with them. Like I had the opportunity to do in my role. So, uh, but I always thought it made sense that if you're going to, how are you going to determine who's all are deserving? So throw that out the window. That don't mean nothing now. We agreed on. They're all deserving. They're all great talents. Who needs it the most? Jericho. And that's kind of where we, about that on my side of the discussion, uh, cause I knew that all those guys, if they're on their based on their availability and their health would become the champion anyway, at some point, 
It's inevitable. But I thought Jericho on that, at that place at that time was probably the guy that could benefit from it the most. Simple as that. Well, JR, at the time unification is being discussed, the brand split is also being talked about as it's still a go. This is all Vince McMahon's edict, right? Still two brands and build themselves up as two different brands. Yeah, that was a game plan. And I love the game plan. Uh, I like the brand split a lot, except when they, we started intermingling and the exclusivity became a misnomer. To me, the exclusivity was a selling point of having two brands. If you like stone cold, well, you better watch on Monday. If you like the rock, well, maybe you better watch on Thursday or Friday or whatever the hell, whatever day it's going to be. And I like that. And I also like the fact that keeping them separate and not contaminating them with each other would allow you to have your big super bowl. That's it. That's I said, well, they got WrestleMania. I'm just giving you another main event that you can make millions of dollars on. That's all. It's the super bowl of, 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 uh, of sports entertainment. And that never really happened because the intermingling started right away and all this other shit. And it's just diluted it, diluted it. And, and it became a failure. Well, Jim, here we go. Here starts the trek to vengeance. It's November 27th. It's SmackDown. It's the day after you kiss Vince's ass. This taping is in Wichita and there's two dark matches. Wait till you hear who the folks are involved in these dark matches. One is Brock Lesnar defeating R Randy Orton. That's a hell right. of a dark match. Yeah. They've came up from OVW. Yeah. And then you have Ron Waterman defeating Rico in the dark match. No one talks about Ron Waterman all too much. What was his deal and why didn't he ever make it to the big time? He, well, Ron's a great guy, uh, which normally pre uh, I'm prefacing the fact that he didn't have it. And that's what I'm doing. He's a really good guy, accomplished athlete, uh, high character guy, but he just didn't have the, uh, intangible that you can't manufacture to connect organically with the audience. So, uh, but Ron's a, a nice guy. Here's the deal. Ron and, and Rico were two guys that were down the, were, they were in the process of looking them over and seeing if there's something there, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but quite honestly, they were the, of the four guys, you get, you can figure out where the priorities lie, right? Of the four guys. Now, if you're thinking, well, why didn't they work with Rico work with Orton and Waterman work with, uh, Brock. Well, cause we wanted to see Orton and Lesnar wrestle each other cause the Lord knows they're going to a bunch one of these days. And the other two guys are long shots to make it. The other two are locked. So we wanted to see what we got here, uh, on, on a, or in front of, I'm sure it was a full house close to it. Uh, cameras are rolling. So. Uh, just that, make, that booking makes a lot of sense to me for those reasons. For those of you who may not be familiar with, uh, Ron Waterman, he also was involved in MMA and here's a little right. tidbit. He trained Shane Carwin and specifically for his fight at UFC 116. So little Ron Waterman trivia for you. Was that the Carwin fight with Brock? That was uh 116. It was against Brock. You got it. Yeah, I was there. Yeah, I was there. So that, there's Austin and I, and, uh, Taker was there. Rock was there. I, I think that I think rock. No rock had his own area. They put him in another area for whatever reason, maybe cause he had a larger entourage. I don't know, but my late wife, Jan was with me and we were sitting on the either the first or second, first row, I think, uh, with, uh, those other yahoos Taker and, <laughs> and uh, Austin, uh, they were there. It was just a lot of, a lot of fun. And we went to Brock's locker room when it was over. It's awesome. That was cool. He welcomed us with open arms. Give me a big hug, all sweaty. So, uh, but anyway, it was an interesting night, but that's Ron was, Ron was, a, like I said earlier, he's an accomplished athlete. He was a good coach, but as far as having charisma for, uh, the wrestling business, he didn't. He didn't have that, that intangible connection, uh, the, the connector and, and, and it's, it's as simple as saying some guys have it and some guys don't. 
Makes sense, JR. On that SmackDown as well, Vince attempts to make Trish Stratus, yes, one of my all-time favorites, join his kiss his ass club but the rock saves her and hits vince with a rock bottom thank thank the lord for the rock yeah man <sighs> best in time <laughs> austin's baby face turn continues when he defeats william regal in a strap match and then edge comes to his rescue when angle and regal attack him after the match at this point jr was edge ready for a shot at being the top baby face in your estimation you're getting close you need a little bit more seasoning uh, but boy, he's getting close mm. and it, it was not a matter of his physical maturation. It was a matter of his, uh, his continuing and evolving processing of the game with all the responsibilities that comes with being the top guy or a top guy. Uh, you know, once we broke that tag team up of edge and Christian, you know, uh, Ed seemed to explode and. And people, you know, he disconnected. He had it. He connected with you, and he's still connecting for God's sakes, which is great. I'm happy for. Him. So, uh, I don't, uh, I don't think Edge was quite ready, but he was. He was. Uh, he knew where the finish line was in sight. I'm thrilled to see him back and have been able to overcome his health issues so many years later and still be productive and back in the ring, man. It's just so cool to see him yep. doing what he loves once again. One of my favorite guys, uh, Adam Copeland, one of my favorite guys. And, uh, I got a lot of respect for him and his, his wife, uh, Beth and, and their, their, their beautiful family. They live in, you know, in Asheville and Asheville is like a paradise. If you like the mountains and mm. The color, the leaves changing colors and all those, all those things. Uh, so in any event, he's, uh, he's got a good life. He's built a good life for himself. Uh, and I'm sure that if he didn't want to work anymore, he wouldn't have to. Mm. So I'm proud of him for a lot of things, but proud of him being a good father and a good husband is probably at the top of the list. Well, he's on the rise here, no doubt about it. And around this time, there's also a Yokozuna Memorial show that takes place in Allentown, PA, not too far from me. And after his death, which features several WWF talents, Rikishi's there, The Undertaker, Kane, Acolytes, among others. Who would deal with these guys doing these small shows uh, in talent relations? Was this something that you would sign off on and be involved with? Uh, on this uh like these independent third party shows? shows. Yeah. 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 They go through me. Okay. But you know, but we always cooperated and they, especially, uh, Yoko's family needed anything. We we're going to help them out. It wouldn't even just, that wouldn't even be a blip in the screen. So what are we going to do? We're going to help them. Yeah. We're going to help them. And, and, uh, what we're going to do, what we should do. So, but it would come through the talent relations department and I would sign off and, and, uh, then would have an agent go. Like a Jack Lance or, or, uh, you know, Jim Myers, George, the animal, uh, Tony Gurria, we would have, there'd always be representation of the office there just to make sure if the guys needed anything or they're having any issues of any kind that the, that agent person could, could intervene if necessary. It never really ever happened. Basically, you just want to make sure you're taking care of your talent. That's why you're there. Yeah, it's pretty cool. There were some other guys that we would be familiar with. Billy Kidman, Loki, Shannon Moore, Homicide, all involved in that show. So I think it's special to see how you and the team at WWF were willing to participate for Yoko and be a part of that. Um, so we're, you're already running split squad here, house shows, where one group is in one loop, another is on another loop. This isn't anything out of the ordinary. The WWF hasn't done already in the past or, you know, when business is hot, is this really though, the trial run in your mind to see what's to come for the brand split? Oh yeah, of course. Yeah. In the early days, you're going to see how it's going to work out, what travel issues are going to be are going to occur. You know, somebody didn't speak up. They've been riding with somebody for, you know, regularly, they got their system worked out. Then you bust them up. That's an adjustment. And some people adjusted to that, those changes better than others. And if you can solve the issue, but I, I was never really big on, uh, uh, booking them. We did it. We did it. So I'm not going to say we didn't, but we did, but we tried not to have to make all the couples happy because hmm. you never, those are volatile relationships. Hmm. 
entertainers are high strung and e egocentric and insecure and all those things. And then, uh, then you have the, the challenge of being in a relationship on the road, uh, it compounds it somewhat. So, uh, but we tried to accommodate and there's examples of that. People can look up. We, we did try to accommodate. But it, that's what happened with the brand split that, that we didn't really consider that much was keeping the couples who are dating. They're not married now. They're dating uh, together on the same rosters. They could travel and share a hotel and all that good stuff. Yeah, I think they give a lot more credence to that nowadays when they do the brand split, splits. You're, you typically see them trying to accommodate uh, the couples a lot more yep. than probably yep. in that era. Well, JR, we move forward. It's December 3rd. We're getting closer and closer to the big event. It's Raw in Milwaukee. Steve Austin defeats Chris Jericho in a non-total match. And The Rock teamed with Trish Stratus to defeat Kurt Angle and Vince McMahon. And due to the pre-match stipulation, now Vince would have to kiss Rock's ass on SmackDown or Angle would be removed from the Vengeance Tournament. Lots of ass-kissing going on here, Jim. Yeah, yeah. Vince got on an ass-kissing... Ass uh... Binge. My goodness. So I mean, watching Yellowstone, <laughs> God forbid. I watched one episode. I, well, I'll go back and watch this. One. <laughs> you know, that uh, deal. Great show. People get, love it. Yeah. I can't get enough of that. So well, it's, uh, it's my replacement for the Sopranos. Ah, I'm not saying it's better than the Sopranos, but I, I, I've, I've emotionally invested in all the characters. I like their individual stories and they're very good at writing and maintaining continuity. It's like the good pro wrestling show should be, uh, continuity is key. And, uh, some promoters think that many of their fans have no memory. How they get home <laughs> or I forgot where I live. I'm a wrestling fan. Oh, that's right. Well, one thing that with the continuity was flowing here and that was someone each week was going to be sucking Vince McMahon's ass. So there we go. Uh, Meltzer would discuss how this role was used to really promote SmackDown instead of the pay-per-view. There isn't a lot to build in terms of the pay-per-view, which is crazy to think about because it'll be the unification JR of the two biggest titles in pro wrestling history was the edict, not to mention how big these titles are and the importance. I mean, no. that's what they're saying. Oh, not really. Uh, it was, it was, uh, the priorities of that show was, were to promote SmackDown. Hmm. And, you know, I don't know how many wagons you can load different products, but, uh, we, I, you know, I'm sure that we sold the pay-per-view on that show as well. Maybe not as aggressively as in the past, but before the brand split, I don't know. Uh, but no, it, it was never no edict at all. No, there were no edicts in that respect whatsoever. JR, I got to ask, do you remember why the rush to split the titles when in theory you're going to need, I'm sorry, to merge the titles when in theory, you're going to need two champions. If you're running two separate brands, well, you had an intercontinental champion. You had the world champion. What do you want? The Oklahoma champion, the uh, Southwest Indiana champion, the central P Pennsylvania champion. Uh, it was, to, it was to clean it up and, to, and, to, and unclutter things so that you had your champion. He's, he's almost like a traveling champion. So that when you advertise him to be on your show, it would hopefully be a big, a big deal. Okay. And it wasn't based there, but, uh, that was kind of the idea in theory of the traveling champion. I didn't, not like flair would work, you know, wrestle 300 days a year or something all over the, all over the world. Uh, not that, uh, but in theory, he could travel from brand to brand and so forth. And. And the, and the other thing it would do with smart booking, smart writing is if, if Austin's the champion, let's say, for example, and he's on raw, uh, he doesn't have to wrestle every week to delve into a storyline. And, uh, so a lot of that's promo time or angle time, that type stuff. So, uh, that's how, that's how I always looked at that scenario. And I might be wrong about it, but that's my, my take on it. My feel for that at that time. So keep the champion a little bit more special, have him bounce around here and there, maybe not wrestling as much, but when he does show up on your show, it's a bigger deal than somebody that's there every single Monday or every right. single Friday. I got you. Cause you're not, they're not overexposed and they stay fresher longer. Makes sense. 
if it was only uh, if only the storylines uh, headed that way and worked that way, uh, it could have been could have been more successful. So yep. we have we have the Hardys now, J- uh, Jr. We're at SmackDown right before the pay per view, and the Hardys break up on SmackDown to give them two days to build to the first Matt versus yep. Jeff matchup. Well, obviously bad planning. Obviously bad. Uh, I'm not saying the breakup of Matt and Jeff. Now I, I would have no interest in breaking up Matt and Jeff. I think it's, uh, you're reaching for something you dropped your booking pencil on the floor and you, you, you're looking for it. Uh, I, I would never, I, I just didn't see any, any reason for that because they're so easy to put together and to do stories with, uh, you know, uh, in and out, in and out of their tags, but I would not have bro- broken them up, but they did. And, but the, the sin is not that the sin is give it two days to percolate to mm. actually have any meaning at all at the pay-per-view. Well, Jr. we've made it. It's December 9th, 2001. It's vengeance. It takes place San Diego sports arena in front of 11,800 fans who paid $550,580 plus another hundred thousand dollars in merchandise, which Meltzer points out are all records in San Diego at that time. So big business here. Yeah. Good, good night at the office for everybody. Sold some shirts and, uh, sold a lot of tickets. I remember that being a really, uh, uh, fun crowd. Uh, they just seem to be full of energy and that means so much to the live audience means so much to the performers in every area. I don't care if you're a handheld cameraman or what you're doing, uh, that, that, the enthusiasm builds momentum. And it, a momentum creates adrenaline and there's no substitute for adrenaline whatsoever, but it was a good, it was a good house. And, and San Diego was a, one of those markets that it could be feast or famine sometimes. Uh, so, and that we got a little feast out of this one. Well, the show is somewhat well received by the wrestling observer readers. It get, they give it 47% thumbs up, 15% thumbs down and 37% thumbs in the middle. And it opens up with Vincent Kennedy McMahon shredding his way down to the ring, cutting a promo and he's interrupted by Ric Flair who then introduces the first match. JR, we're going to get right into it. The first match is Albert and Scotty too hotty. They defeat Test and Christian in six minutes, 20 seconds. When Albert pinned Christian after the Baldo bomb, it came across like another heat match. Again, this is all uh, according to Meltzer. Biggest thing was pushing Albert dancing as the hip hop hippo. Scotty did the worm on Test, who rolled out of the ring. Christian hit a reverse DDT on Scotty, but Albert used his finisher on Christian for the pin. Star and a quarter. The hip hop hippo, Jim. King, yeah. King asked you during the broadcast, are they trying to be fly? What do you think of all of this? <laughs> that was funny. That was actually more entertaining than the match. Uh, you know, just somebody will pop something out in a creative meeting and it'll strike uh, a chord with Vince, i.e. the hip hop hippo. Uh, and he's going to roll with it just because he thinks it's funny. And but I also know that there was a time, I'm not sure if this is that time that, but we, there was a point in time where, uh, there was a lot of, uh, optimism for where Matt Bloom was going to go. Mm. And we know why well, not only Matt's a great guy and he's done a hell of a job at the performance center, former college football player, and a, really a good dude. Uh, but his size was what took him out of the, out of the pack. And you're going to beat, uh, who they beat here. They beat Tess and, and Christian. Yes. And, and so it kind of, I don't know. It's just uh, one of those things where the size moves, moves you kind of to the front of the line, at least for that point in time. To your point, Jim, future NXT trainers and, uh, you know, Matt Bloom's still there. Yeah. Uh, Scotty too hot. moved on. I loved it. I was watching the match earlier. You do mention Matt Bloom, former, former university of Pittsburgh, offensive lineman. You yeah. use that line during the match. And man, I looked, I looked him up as I was watching that. And you're absolutely right. 
he graduated and he started teaching some deaf children. And I saw a lot of teaching in his background. And then it made complete sense as to why he's turned out to be such a good trainer of men and ladies with all that teaching in his background. Yeah, so. it, it, Paul, it comes down to, uh, I think, if te any teacher's worth their salt, be honest about it, it all comes down to communication. How well can you communicate your message to your students or your customers or whatever? Uh, and, you know, Matt has a propensity for doing that very well. So he's a valuable asset there. Uh, and his dad was a college football player. His dad might've played in Michigan. Mm. Uh, and he seemed like he played in the, on the old AFL too, but, uh, it's been too long. I've slept since then. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, it was, it was a normal, it was an opener that didn't have a strong personality. Now it's, it's, it's good to see guys like that who have gone on to be successful still in the wrestling business in different ways. You know, it's not necessarily maybe that out in front of the camera, sexy role, but guys like Matt Bloom and even Scotty too have probably had so much big time influence on so many wrestlers that are now in the business. I just think it's cool to kind of give them a minute and talk a little bit about what they've been able to accomplish in wrestling. So there you go. Yeah. All those guys do a good job. And they're, like I said, the key is they're all good communicators. Mm. They want to communicate and they want their message to reach the, whom, whom it's intended for. And, uh, but they have great patience and love for the business. I don't know how you could love the business more than a, a coach. Uh, I just don't, I, I, I can't relate to it. You, you can say, well, it's a job. Well, that if it's only just a job, you're asked to need to be here, not in this role. You know, you can't be hands-free. You can't, you know, you got to actually, uh, have a conversation. Everything can't be text messaging or, or, or some other process. Right. So yeah, it's the, they're, they're a they're valuable asset. And that's, you know, it's like the guys at AEW, my God. You got Dean Malenko and Jerry Lynn, and Billy Gunn, uh, Christopher Daniels. I know I'm leaving people out. That's okay. Of, Sanjay Dutt. You have, uh, yeah, yeah. Sanjay is Jerry Lynn. Yeah. I mentioned Jerry. Did you? Yeah. yeah. Great, great guys. So we got a good staff too. And I, uh, and they're, they're all, especially, uh, Jerry Lynn and Dean Malenko. If you talk to really pro wrestling people that have been around the block a couple of times, uh, where they don't, you know, it's just, you, you'll realize that those two guys are, are praised about as much as any two guys you'll find. They're great workers. They're not in the, and they got over and they made money and they worked at main events at five, eight or five, seven, mm. their work, their workers, they know how they have high skill sets and they're willing to share that knowledge with the these, uh, wrestlers in, in AEW and the uh, same as all our, all of our guys that, that way. I mean, you know, we, some of them reach different talents better, but that's normal. That's why you have a quarterback coach. He's not the quarterback coach and the offensive line coach. They're special. There's, they do special things. So anyway, that's, uh, that's kind of my, my thought on those guys are invaluable. It's kind of cool too, to Dustin, see what, Dustin, 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 yes. Yes. Dustin Runnels does a phenomenal job with the women. He's got, yeah. And he's got his own school down there in Texas and doing real well. I hear, uh, but he does a really a, a good job because I've had a lot of the females, uh, approach me about, uh, how great, how much they're enjoying the process largely thanks to Dustin. And I think that's a great compliment. That's exactly where I was headed. We've had the opportunity again at freeshows.com to have Dustin on a few times on Rebels Happy Hour. And uh, she's broadcast live from his school. And he's joined us and talked to all our top guys. And he talks about wrestling, but training women. And it's just been so cool to see him just yeah. be real and talk with us and hear his influence that he's gotten to have uh, with women's wrestling. So, man, just very cool to see what he's doing, too. So I'll probably be accused of being chauvinistic. I've been accused of that before, uh, and, uh, and, and sometimes probably rightfully so, but there's a, it's a lost art about how to coach a female. Now, some females are going to get pissed like they say, well, that's you know, he's a, whatever those people do chauvinistic or whatever. No, I'm just saying that women are more sensitive. They got more, it's a compliment actually, 
the guys are sometimes they, they take in, it to heart and want to do better. They do. Their yes. passion is more pronounced. There you go. Females are more pronounced and they, they, they really emotionally invest in their business. There you go. And I, I love that. So, uh, but Dustin has the ability to communicate with them. And, and sometimes it's because look, a female is they're in a different, they're, unfortunately they're judged differently appearance, their hair, is it real hair is it extensions? Yeah. Other uh, body is it, is it all enhanced? Is it, you know, how many, how many boob jobs are on the roster type deal? So they have all these things that they have to be, they feel like they have to be concerned about their gear, the colors they wear, like I said, their hair, their, their body, overall body, their makeup. You think CM Punk worries about his makeup when he goes out to wrestle? <laughs> I don't think so. Right. The jet, you're it may surprise right. me, but I don't think that he does. Yeah. So, uh, but yeah, so that's kind of, it's a unique community that the females live in, in pro wrestling. Mm. And I understand, and I'm not excluding the world, everybody. I'm not here to make a, you know, not a minister. God. Pastor Jim Ross, everybody. Yeah. Uh, yeah the Reverend, good. Reverend Jr. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I, I passed the entrance exam on that one, I think. <laughs> or maybe I didn't pass the entrance exam on it. Uh, but anyway, that's, it's a different world, different culture. I don't, and I mean that with all respect because sometimes the women and just in my observation over the many, many years care more about more things they have to, they feel like than a man does, and that's not fair, but it is unfortunately how it is. And the ones that can navigate those bumpy roads, you know, end up kicking ass. It, it's a more critical lens, unfortunately, in the world yep. that we, that we live, I think is what you're trying to say. And it's not right. No. All right. Up, up next, JR, we'll keep it rolling. Uh, we see edge versus William Regal for the intercontinental uh, championship. And, and Dave would go on to say that edge retained the intercontinental championship pinning Regal at nine minutes, eight seconds. At one point plans were for Regal to win the title. The idea is that Edge is ready to get that major push, which we talked about earlier. So the thought process was whether it was better for Edge to have him chase new champ Regal in a program or get a pay-per-view win and the latter view won out. Edge missed a shoulder block off the apron and crashed into the ring steps. Regal took some brass knucks hidden in a corner. Regal got a pin, but Edge's foot was on the ropes and it kept going. Regal did two double arm power bombs for a near fall. Regal set up a 70s Nux spot as he pulled them out, but Edge speared him before he could take the shot and got the pen. Pen, it's two and a quarter stars. This does seem like the beginning of the Edge push that we talked about um, and yeah. that we saw on Raw, and it's really starting to take shape for him. You'd see it in 2002, and I and Jim, the question is, did you really see him becoming that top level uh, superstar here at this point? Oh yeah, absolutely. He had it. The audience told you every time he came out that they wanted to see him, they're glad to see him. And consequently that normally tra translates also into, uh, I want to see him more often. So no, I, there's no, the, you got all the market research you needed from the live audiences. They loved him. Uh, and I loved his character and I loved his, uh, his professionalism in the locker room. I, you know, he just, uh, his special athlete and to. William Regal's credit, he was put in that match to make sure edge looked good. And, and of course the, the, whoever laid the match out, made sure that Regal got a little shine because he had a chance to win and he got his, uh, he got, he got nailed before the, he could use those nuts. So the guy that was putting edge over had to be a key component too. No margin for error type thing. And, uh, you, you get that every time with Regal, very, very consistent. Very consistent. Good guy. We move on to match three and it's the Hardys. It's Jeff Hardy against Matt Hardy. Jeff pins Matt Hardy in 12 minutes, 32 seconds. Lita is the referee and Meltzer would say very disappointing crowd reactions. People well, really they, didn't take Matt as a heel uh, yet. Well, Matt, two days, they had two days to figure it yeah. out, Paul, it, yeah. whether he's the heel or baby face or whatever, a chameleon, it doesn't matter. The bottom line was they had the fans had two days to process this entire new story. These, these two new identities, 
uh, uh, it's like me mispronouncing Daniel Bryan or Brian Danielson. You get it, it's embedded in your mind and it takes a lot of practice or focus, uh, to, to stay away from those mistakes. Uh, but you know, these two guys are, they're married together. They're, they're you know, they're the, they're the most, I'll tell you this, the Hardys are the most, are the greatest team ever developed in WWE. Think about it. Mm. Uh, actually, no, I'm not talking about Arn and Tully or the Dudleys or some of those other great teams that, that came through there, but there were teams when they got there, a lot of, them. yeah. Uh, and Matt and Jeff came in wearing their own little homemade, uh, wrestling tights and they, they sewed on their own sewing machine. I think it was their mom, their late moms. I just love the story and I love their enthusiasm and I love their, 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 their youthful passion. And I, I don't think there's ever been a better tag team that was developed in WWE than the Hardys. Now, so well, they, they wrestled in the, uh, that independent thing they did in North Carolina. All, all I say about that is that they don't, that don't count. They don't count for, uh, regarding what we're talking about, but, uh, they, uh, and I hope that someday they go in the hall of fame there. I don't know how that's going to happen or it's going to work out. Go Jeff, you know, leaving, uh, unfortunately under some cloud of whatever it is, controversy, I don't know. Uh, but they deserve accolades because WWE has never developed a better tag team homegrown than the Hardy boys, in my opinion. You have heard it right there from, from Jim Ross. Listen, Jr. the match was one of those bouts where you expected too much. This is again, according to Meltzer, but it was a big letdown, not a lot of heat. Biggest spot was Matt doing the power bomb sunset flip spot off the apron onto the floor, but Jeff rolling through with a hurricane Rana. It appeared Jeff hit his head on the floor on the way over. Mostly Jeff selling the left knee with Matt playing the subtle heel. Lita caught Matt using the ropes later. Jeff blocked the twist of fate off the middle rope and hit the swanton. Matt got his leg dropped over the ropes, but Lita didn't see it and counted the pin. Later in the show, Lita tried to apologize for her screw up, but Matt walked out on her very unique booking in that Matt is actually right in being mad at the other two because they were making mistakes, but still there's little heat and he's the heel. Yeah. Dave gave it a star and three quarters. Well, here's the thing. Would you go into a, to a meat market and buy aged beef? You see it's aged 48 hours. That ain't aged beef. Two days to recondition the audience. Who is the heel? And who's the baby face in this scenario? So, and the audience didn't really want to accept either one of them as a heel, and they just weren't ready for it. So, I, I how this was absorbed by Meltzer and Dave's opinion, I can't disagree with, but I know the reason why. It had they had two days of fans had two days to process it, and that ain't enough. And I think as fans, do you really want to see Matt and Jeff Hardy versus each other? I mean, I like to see the Hardy boys together. Yeah. Like I said, it, if, if I owned a territory and I had a chance to get the Hardy boys as a tag team, that's what they would be. Yeah. That's what they would be a team. Should be interesting to see what comes in the next few months or so. You said it, as you were talking earlier, Jeff is no longer a part of the WWE and. And, you know, for Jeff's sake, whatever he's going through, he hopes that's certainly his priority and enjoying the holidays. I've heard Conrad talk a little bit about it too, uh, with Eric, um, don't know all what was, what no. happened there, but we'll see. Yeah. And this, yeah. Yeah, step away. We don't know all the details. So we all rushed to judgment. It's probably a, the worst case scenario. Uh, and, and I don't know that to be true. I don't, I don't know the particulars of this matter. Look, I've had more one-on-one -on -one talks with Jeff Hardy than maybe anybody in the business. I, I know of which I speak on this, one, but he's got a good heart. And he's got, he's got a good soul and, and he's, but he's got some weaknesses that he has had to deal with. And it's, but my God, that's, that's just the, that's the way of the world. Now that we're all willing to talk about things like that. So I, I think it, you know, just biggest issue now, if I were, if I was, if he called me and said, I need, give me some advice, I'd say get healthy. Enjoy your family, finish your Christmas shopping and enjoy, uh, your family at the holidays, especially the most special time of the year. 
and, uh, and appreciate what you got. Count your blessings, buddy. So, uh, that's what I'd say to him, but I hope that someday, uh, he's wrestling for AEW. It's a no brainer. Can you imagine the young bucks and the Hardy boys dream you match, know, the Hardys and the Lucha bros, the Hardys and FTR, the battle of North Carolina. Whew. I'm all about this stuff. There's a year right there. Easy. So in any event, when, when the lay of the land is conducive, you know, Tony Khan has proven time and time again, he's got a great eye for talent. He's still a fan. He looks at somebody that does that person excite you, Tony? Yes. So you can write for him, right? Absolutely. No, so that's, uh, we'll see. We'll see. It's time's got to go. We ain't got to do it today, but somewhere down the road, that'd be the thing to do. And it would help the tag team scene immensely. Mm. All right. We move on to match four. all good stuff. Thank you for sharing Jr. match four. It's the Dudleys retaining the WWF tag titles over big show and Kane and Jr. This one didn't take very long. Six minutes, 49 seconds. And it's the same match as they did at the house shows, almost spot for spot, except for Kane threw, uh, threw in a plancha until the finish show looked terrible. Again, this is all Meltzer doing those stationary clotheslines. The guys had to run into Dudley's couldn't save this finish. Saw Bubba undo the padding on the top turnbuckle and they pick show up in a flapjack like move. And he hit his head on the steel and was pinned. This one got a quarter star. Do you think the big show is just going through the motions at this point? I don't know. It just didn't, it just didn't click. And, and quite frankly, the level of talent in that match was way too high for the match not to be immensely better. Now I'm not saying that that day's, uh, ratings or the gospel or using them as such in this particular presentation. Uh, but no matter what, it wasn't a great match. It, it, the, the, the chemistry wasn't there. I can't tell you why, because all those guys, oh, by the way, I signed all of them too. Mm. So, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know what to say, Paul, I, I, it under, it under delivered and it was disappointing. There's an influx of talent right now in this, in, in WWF for sure. And maybe it's one of those things people, certain people are trying to find their way through uh, their yeah. place in the world. Big Josh. You never know. You never yeah. know. And back and this we're talking 20 years ago, right? Absolutely. You know, I can't remember what I had for lunch, <laughs> but you do remember what you had. For I have something in the oven and it I was fantastic. I have something in the oven that'll be ready to eat when we we're finished. Uh, but that's the only reason I'm going to have that figured out. <laughs> so I, I really seriously, I, I can't remember. I don't, I don't know that there was any, I don't think there's any personal issues with any of those four guys. Yeah. But they didn't want to work together. I just think it was one of those nights where it just it didn't click. And, and I'm sure there's a story behind it, but I don't, I don't know that story. Well, we'll move on then Jr. to the undertaker. He's taking on Rob Van Dam and it's for the hardcore title. It's 11 minutes, four seconds. Undertaker's getting all the cheers coming out, partially due to the bike and the music. Van Dam got louder cheers. And when he came out and undertaker tried to work as the demented heel, remember takers a heel now guys. At one point, Undertaker choked Van Dam with a Mexican flag as they were brawling in the stands. Much of the match was on the stage and a little backstage, including Van Dam spraying him with a fire extinguisher and doing a plancha off the balcony, which looked to be about eight and a half feet high. Teased a last ride on the stage, but Van Dam grabbed part of the set and pulled himself out. After a missed Van Daminator, Undertaker choked slam Van Dam off the stage onto two tables. Lots of padding clearly underneath and pinned him on the tables. Good match, but not nearly the caliber of Van Dam's previous WWF pay-per-view bouts. Meltzer did give it three stars. Do you think Taker really needed the hardcore title to get himself over as a heel at this point? No, he didn't need any, he didn't need any title to do anything. He was over. Once you're over, you're over. And Taker is all is for decades has been over. But you know, it was, uh, uh, I don't know if it was, it may have been done Paul, just to the other side of that equation to give the hardcore title some credence mm. was it, it was just another watered down championship. And now it's even worse. The 24, seven title, right? That's hideous. Yeah. It's not even realistic. And it's had so many champions. You can't name them all. 
So, uh, in any event, I think it might've been a little bit of that, but anytime, uh, I don't know. I, I, I don't, it's a, it's an odd situation to be honest with you. Uh, but I, I didn't think it was a bad match whatsoever, to be honest with you, but I, I'm with you. I understand. Did Taker need the hardcore title? No, he did not need the hardcore title. But uh, then, then the next question somebody's listening and watching are going to say, "But why do they do it? Because it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a speculative type process. You think you've got a great, a riff for a song you're writing, and unfortunately, at the end of the day, when the song's complete, the only person that likes the song is you. And sometimes it's just that way in, those, in the creative process. Everything's not going to be a dramatic wonderfully executed, uh, piece of theatrics, but for what those guys are doing, work with in, in, inanimate objects all around the ring staged here, there, and yon. Uh, I just didn't think it was a bad match whatsoever, but did take need a title? No, he didn't need the title. And maybe Vince just thought it was time to get, you know, maybe if I put this damn title on taker, maybe he'll make it mean more. Possibly. Then you'll have the other folks or people out there. They'll say, well, well, don't you think that it could have been better for RVD if, if he would have won, you know, that would have helped build his character and, and maybe help him get over if he beats the undertaker, you know, so you're yeah. going to get all of it when it comes oh, to yeah. questioning the creator. That's fine. And, 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 and look, uh, that person you emulated may be right. That's right. And so, okay. There's 16 different ways to look at this. Don't break your arm, pat yourself on the back. There's right. more than one right way to do things, folks. We move on to Trish Stratus retaining the women's title. This is match six over Jackie. And this one, JR, three minutes and 26 seconds. Okay. This is where we're at with women's matches at this point. They tried. They ran out of time. That's what happened there. Uh, something prior to their match went extremely long. Ah, okay. And they had, and you're not going to take the time away from Taker. And she was sandwiched between Taker and Austin. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, you're just not going to, who you, you got to rob Peter to pay Paul sometimes. And unfortunately, uh, match number six with Trish in it happened to be a female match. It could, if it had been a guy's match, they're going to get their time cut too. Okay. Ask you, ask a lot of guys that work there. Oh, that's one of the big, big, just, uh, boo boos. It just stinks because it is the female match and there was only one on the card as there was at this point. Yeah. So it, you know the, what I mean? But, yeah, but of course, but the perception is different Paul, than it is now where women are getting True. their just due. They were special attraction performers in that era more often than not. However, I will say without question that, uh, Trish. And Lita helped lead that charge of doing more things, more athletic things. And they got that, that lens turned to a different view of females. And I'll tell you, we never hired, I never hired a more valuable female than Jackie Moore ever, ever. Jackie was never late. Jackie was, was a professional. She could, she could wrestle anybody of any gender that you wanted to book her with and she would go out there and work snug and she would work fundamentally sound. Uh, she was a big, uh, she was a big difference maker and knowing that you got a match here that went to uh, three minutes and 26 seconds, when you know, and going in, it wasn't booked to go that short. Uh, then they find out before they go out there. Oh, by the way, your match is now you got to get everything done within four minutes and they had eight. Now they got to cut half their match out. It's, it's really unfair. Mm. Uh, so, but nobody want to go tell Austin. Oh yeah. Steve, your, your 15 minute match is now 10. Well, he'd go crazy. And he was pulling the wagon by and large and had been. So there's a lot of reasons for that stuff. It wasn't, it certainly was not to uh, you know, play down the females. They're in a, they're booked in a bad spot. And, uh, so their, their, their match became the accordion, like Matt, the accordion match, you know, that, that deal. And too, though, do you think when they're 
putting together or booking the card, putting the match there, saying whoever's book, putting the the card together, hey, if we have a time issue, we know we have that match prior to some of our main event matches. Yeah, 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 yeah. So and you you gotta, but the the point I was trying to make, I didn't do a good job of it. Was that how well Jackie Moore adapted to getting her match cut probably in half and leading a less experienced, uh, uh, higher, you know, the, the perception that we're, Trish is going to be a made woman. Super she became a made woman. Yeah. But to get there, it ain't acapella here. You gotta have, a, you gotta have some backup. And, uh, Jackie Moore was just phen- phenomenal with that. And I'm glad she's in the hall of fame. And, uh, you know, and I, I just, I despise the fact that people say, well, she's in the hall of fame because they had to, they had to induct a, uh, a female. Oh, and as a black female, it's even better. See, that's bullshit. She got in the hall of fame because all her service years of service to the wrestling business and how much her con- contributions were and how we perceived her contributions. That's how I looked at it. Mm. I don't know if I was even with the company when that happened. I had some, you know, I did have a few, uh, uh, what they call it. What's the cable company say, uh, the, uh, interruption in service. Oh, okay. Disruption in service. Yeah. Yeah. This, I had a few of those. So okay. I mean, I didn't go to every hall of fame, but I sure as hell watched and I was sure as heck proud of, of Jackie Moore MVP that rarely gets talked about. And it's just not, it's not really fair in my estimation. You ask those women, she worked those young girls. She worked with, they'll tell you. They'll tell you. Yeah. Ask Trish Stratus how much she respects Jackie Moore. She'll tell you, but that's not the headline thing. So, you know, it's not good enough a sizzle to it, I guess. I don't know. Well, Trish. But any, anyway, yeah. Austin gets enough time to have a decent match. That's, and that's right. kind of, uh, you know, you had a lot of other stuff you got to get to. Yep. Trish does win this one, like we said, with a backslide. It got a quarter of a star, and like you said, a lot of it is just time and what what they have to work with, and, and yep. so it is what it is. We move on. It is Austin's turn. It's match number seven. It's Stone Cold retaining the WWF title for the last time, pitting Kurt Angle in 15 minutes. It was Angle's 32nd birthday. That's right. He's a December. He's a December baby. He just had his 53rd birthday, Jr. Yeah. Uh, and uh, Austin posted Angle's left arm a few times. Angle went to the ankle lock several times to work the leg, and also did a figure four around the ring post. Angle did three back suplexes for a near fall, then missed a moonsault. Austin came back with five back suplexes for a near fall. Angle used an angle slam, but Austin kicked out. Austin came back with a stunner. This one gets three and a half stars from Dave. And, uh, man, this is going to be a huge stretch of matches here with these four. Austin's winning here. It's a big moment. But this is a match we've seen at this point four or five times probably between pay-per-view and title changers on Raw. Was it getting to be too much between might, th- this match here? Might have been. Might have been. Uh, interesting story, though. I love the story of this whole concept because uh, uh, there's so much marquee, so much star power. Uh, I, I, I just can't not like it because the guy, all the guys in it, I made an emotional investment in and, and they were, they were improving their careers. They're, they're moving up the ladder. They're getting to, in a promised land area of money. So I was happy as hell for them, but yeah, I, I didn't have an, I didn't have an issue. With it. It's just, it's a unique concept. And I don't know that it had been done before to that level in that forum. Yeah, this is definitely uh, JR's group here, the next several matches, because now we're on to match eight, and it's Chris Jericho, who we know you were very uh, responsible for bringing him into the WWF at the time. Yep. And he's facing The Rock again, another big time recruit of yours. So Chris Jericho <laughs> wins, which, which was uh, he wins the WCW title. Pinning Rock in 19 minutes and five seconds. Earlier in the show, they had they had both Jericho and Angle confront Ric Flair, noting that Flair had never been undisputed world champion. So they want to make sure they let him know about that. They pushed Flair as a 16-time champion, and that's a very conservative estimate. This is all from Meltzer. Jericho used a lion salt for a near fall. Jericho went head first into the post. Later, Rock blocked Jericho's attempt at a rock bottom and DDT'd him through the English table. Jericho blocked the rock bottom and hit his breakdown for a near fall. 
Rock went for the people's elbow, but it was reversed by Jericho into a sharpshooter, which was a spot that really picked the crowd up. Rope break. Rock did a rock bottom, but couldn't follow up. Vince came out and distracted the ref, missing the pinfall. Rock punched Vince and hit a spine buster on Jericho. He set up the people's elbow again, but before delivering it, threw Vince in the ring. He hit the elbow, but again, no ref. In the confusion, Jericho hit a low blow and pin Rock with his own rock bottom finisher. This is a four-star match, according to Meltzer. Yeah, a good match. Those guys had great chemistry, Rock and uh, and uh, Chris. They they did like they liked each other. They still like each other, I'm assuming. But they they had good chemistry. They they're on the same plane. They uh, they knew how important Sizzle was to the process, while not forgetting to deliver the steak. So uh, I always every time they worked in tags or in singles, I always enjoyed the fact that I might get to call it. It's always good stuff. Yeah, absolutely. If you, if you haven't watched this one in a long time, go back, watch this. The temp, the chemistry here is really just tough to beat. Yep. And, uh, you know, to your point earlier, Jericho picks up the big win. It, do you think Vince is now fully aligned with Jericho in terms of, Hey, we're, we're going to put the, uh, put everything behind this guy in terms of moving him forward. Well, that was the plan. You know, that was the plan, uh, you know, to give Chris that championship and, and some time to let it, uh, set in soak in whatever you want to say. Uh, but yeah, I think Vince was aligned with it, you know, he, or he wouldn't have done it. I, he, he's, he's been, he could have just easily had Austin go over to that last match. Uh, if he'd have chosen to, but he had Jericho. He just beat, he, even though he cheated to win over rock, uh, he's getting ready to beat Austin. And I don't know is if there's ever any, you think Vince was committed. Are you shitting me? Yeah. 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 I mean, how could you think anything else really? Unless you're just an eternal pessimist. Jericho goes 19 minutes with the rock and then turns right back around and goes 12 minutes, 33 seconds with stone cold, Steve Austin. He wins the WWF title from stone cold to combine both belts, which is making history. History is made. Chris still talks about it to this day from time to time. And, uh, let's get into the match results. Angle immediately hit Austin with a chair shot and rock gave Jericho a rock bottom just before the bell rang to start the match. So we're already starting off with some chicanery. Pat Patterson, Pat Patterson. He's got, he's written his, his, his fingerprints are all over it. Mm. He start, you know, he, he, you got heat on Jericho the referee couldn't do anything about it because the match had not started. So Jericho gets an unfair advantage to establish, uh, where the story is going to start. Then Austin's got a fight from underneath, as they say, because mm. he's in, on the defensive side of the ball and Jericho's uh, running wild offensively. So now the, the, uh, the, the legendary stone cold has got to fight from underneath and show what he's got. And I, I just love that story. I thought they told a hell of a story and, you know, then they use Vince. It's easy to say Vince was used too much, but considering Vince is the hottest heel of that era at that point in time, why the hell wouldn't you use it? You'd be stupid right. not to. Well, we get into the match. Jr. Austin throws Jericho into the post and undid the mats. Here we go. Jericho tried for the walls on the Spanish announce table table, man, love the Spanish announce table. You always knew the action was going down there, but yeah. Austin powered out and Jericho took a bump off the table. Austin had undone the mats and suplexed Jericho on the floor. Jericho in the ring used a Fujiwara arm bar with the ropes for leverage. Jericho got the walls, but Austin made the ropes ref bump by Hebner. Jericho did a low blow and a mistime stunner as Austin went down late. And here comes Vince. He comes out with Nick Patrick but before he could make a count. Flair comes out and decks Patrick. Vince punched Flair and posted him, taking him out. Austin used a low blow and a Boston Crab. Jericho was tapping like crazy, but no ref. Booker T ran out of the crowd and hit Austin with one of the belts while Vince threw Hebner in the ring to make the count. Finish live was flat, according to Dave. It got three and a quarter stars. You were there, JR. Do you remember this? I didn't think it was flat. I think the audience was getting tired. Mm. I think they'd seen some of the same faces 
out there for a good while, but I know I didn't think it was flat at all. I, 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 I enjoyed the match. I enjoyed the stories being told. Uh, and you could go in and pick apart anything you want to pick apart as far as the ref bump by Hebner, you know, Booker T's involvement, Vince coming out and all those things, but that's how that was scheduled. That's how it was uh, scripted to do. And, uh, and you can, like I said earlier, you can tell that Pat Patterson's hands were all over this thing. You know, Pat was going to be involved. The rock was in a match because that was their, they were their pair. Uh, but also with Steve, Steve loved Pat and his mind booking mind because Pat worked in a small territory, uh, in San Francisco. Uh, he understood the, how to book uniquely, how to keep changing the story up, but travel in the same direction to the same destination. That's the art of run, uh, working in a weekly territory, a weekly territory, meaning the same towns run basically on the same nights every week. So how do you change your play up? How do you change your, your, you, you can't ch always change your casting because that's, uh, you know, it's, that's just not feasible. They have 14 guys in a territory. So Patterson used all that expertise and that experience to make this thing work. And I thought it was, I thought the, I thought the president, excuse me, the presentation in general was very strong. Do you think, uh, Jr. having Booker help and Vince help Jericho, uh, does it make him seem weak? Uh, I mean, he's a heel, so that's okay, right? Yep. It, it is okay. I'm sure you can make it. Somebody can make a case that it uh, diluted Jericho's win. Uh, but Jericho leaves with the title and that's the image you want to, you want to show and highlight. So, uh, you know. I, I, I like that. If Chris was a baby face, yeah, of course. Yeah. Uh, but I, Chris being a heel and us needing hot heels, uh, you know, you try to get a little heat on Booker and you get a little heat, more heat on Vince who had plenty. And now you're getting Jericho in that same, uh, kettle, that same atmosphere. So, uh, I, but he left for the title. Uh, and I think that's, that was what we're trying to do. So I, I, I like, I, I didn't. I, I didn't, I liked the show from start to finish, but there are certain things on it. I liked a lot better than others. And that presentation for the unifying the title was one of those things. Mm. Well, and I don't think enough can be said about Chris and his effort in back to back matches with two of the top performers of all time going 30 yeah. plus minutes. Well, it, 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 if that didn't, it, we've, that can't make Jericho look weak. Uh, again, at the end of the day, we're talking about the outcome and not talking about all the spots that it took to get to the arrive at that outcome. So, uh, I think that my point is the most poignant facets of that match and that presentation were getting Jericho was getting Jericho elevated and him leaving with the championship as the first ever undisputed champion. And I thought we accomplished that. JR, do you remember if they were thinking far enough ahead to say, Hey, we know at some point triple H is going to come back. He's going to be the baby face. Let's put the title on Chris and we'll just sacrifice him to triple H when he comes back as far as, you know, for triple H to walk away with the title. Was there, was there some of that logic going on at this point or, or of no? course, because triple H is that good, uh, uh, you know, he was, uh, he was evolving to one of our biggest stars in recent memory. So yeah, of course, if you know, you're getting him back, you, you should plan for his return and not just him show up when, oh yeah, you're at TV this week. Huh? Well, let's figure something out. It didn't work that way. <clears throat> not with him because he was that valuable. <clears throat> Pardon me. And that good. Sure. So, uh, but you have to talk about it just because you want to, you want to line up all your talent. And you want to include triple H in that roster. You need him to play. So no, I think it was, it was thought about and maybe other guys too, but certainly triple H was considered for the championship. Well, Jr. before we get to the fan questions, what did you think about this show? Vengeance 2001 overall thoughts, solid, enjoyed it. You know, uh, I wish we could, it had been time better toward the end. That's a Mickey mouse, little picky thing. Yeah. Uh, I thought, I wish the girls had not been kind of pushed aside. 
uh, unfortunately. But other than that, uh, I thought that the, when you got a scenario with Kurt Angle and Rock, and Steve Austin and Chris Jericho, and I'm going to start picking that shit apart. And I, I need to go watch the weather channel for another eight or 10 hours. Does that make more sense than this trying to <laughs> defend that deal? Uh, well, let's do the fan questions. I love it. Zol Lopez, our buddy, uh, ad free shows, top guy. He chimes in. He said, Jr. and, and. It's a belt question, JR. Was there ever any talk of unveiling a new unified belt prior to the undisputed belt that debuted three months later? Well, as you know, by your inflection, I'm not a big belt guy. <laughs> I couldn't wait for this question. Uh, so I don't know when it was, that was discussed. I'm sure it was because if nothing else, it's a part of the marketing plan because they sell the shit out of those belts. And, and so, you know, that creating a new product to sell is what great marketers and merchandisers do. So I'm sure it was discussed. Uh, but I, I always excuse myself from those meetings. I got to take a call type thing. I don't give a shit what your bill looks like, man. Jerry, you, you mean to tell me that you haven't been to Conrad's and maybe said, Hey, let me get a picture with one or two of your title belts. You've never done I have that. not. <laughs> no, I got, uh, Hey, I got to. Conrad's the mistake made Conrad has visited my house and seen a lot of my memorabilia. And I think he almost cried when he had to leave it. Oh, wow. Cause there's, there's some heavy duty stuff there, man. Uh, so, but I, I'm just not that passionate about it. Okay. Fair uh, enough. You know, I, 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 do I respect the titles? Of course I do. It's part and parcel of what we're doing here. But, but as far as making, taking time out of my day to think about what am I supposed to do? come up with a belt design? I can tell you if I like it, it's good. looks good. Or it's too big. It's too small, whatever. It looks cheap. It looks, you know, or it looks, it doesn't. So, uh, no, I'm not a big belt guy at all. Obviously Conrad's the, he's the, uh, major D of built world. Oh, gee. Yeah. I mean, when you're talking about the big gold, the one that Ric Flair fought and so many of wrestling royalty held. I don't know. It just feels like there's something, something special to it. I, we'll well, I agree on. with that. Yeah. I agree. With, I agree with that. I'm not knocking all belts just because you got a belt. You're, you're an idiot or you're <sighs> marked for yourself. All I'm saying is, is that that's just not my area of expertise. I got you. And I'm not a designer. Once you get a design or you show me a drawing, I can tell you if I like it or not. I remember one time we stopped making a belt, uh, late in the process and wasted some money because. It had sharp edges on it. Well, if you're going to use it as a prop in a finish, you sure as hell don't want to increase your chances of cutting somebody. So little things like that, I could look at and pick up, but as far as this design's cool, or this is really uh, contemporary or whatever, I hated it. Uh, the, the, uh, spinning things, the spinning, did Austin have a spinning belt? No, uh, it was the John Cena era when the spinner belt came out. And I didn't like that. Yeah. It was too gimmicky. And I didn't like the, the, uh, the, I didn't like the stone, the, uh, rattlesnake, uh, belt. Oh yes. And the reason for it, it, it was great. I, Steve made a lot of money because they, on his royalties, cause they sold all, held all those belts, but God dang, man. Uh, you know, it, it just, it flew in the face of what the belt was supposed to symbolize. So it didn't symbolize the world champion or the, or whatever. Uh, it symbolized an individual and it's strictly made for reselling. Yeah. JR, you're talking about that smoking skull belt that I know all the, the belt wrestling belt, uh, collectors are familiar with there. That's still yeah. cool belt. It was a cool belt, Paul. Yeah. yeah. But it was a, it was a, a gimmick belt. Even though I'm not a, a championship belt aficionado, I know what they're supposed to represent and what they're supposed to symbolize. Yeah. Uh, that'd be like saying, let's, let's put, uh, the last super bowl trophy. Let's put Tom Brady's bust at the top of it. No, it's the Lombardi trophy. It's not going to be tampered with. It's the Stanley cup. They got, they, how many, how many versions of Stanley cup? There's, I don't even how they keep writing their damn names on there. It's unbelievable. So anyway, all right, that's right. That's where I am on that deal. Fernando Diaz is up next. And, uh, we're going to navigate this question together, try to figure it out. If Jr. could have used any two WCW talents that weren't here at the time, 
and would replace Jericho and Angle, how much business would it draw out of WrestleMania? Well, it depend on how you set it up. It depend on how you started the angle. It depend on how you maintenance the angle. It's just not you name names. It's okay. It's a matter of execution. Uh, uh, so, you know, I don't know. You'd always make money adding Goldberg to a scenario. Sure. You know, he'd be somebody you would certainly consider. Uh, but, but, you know, at that time he didn't want to come to work and neither did Hall and Nash and neither did Hogan Sting. Sting. But you could always say, if you want to just cover your ass, you could good old Fernando here and answer. You could say, <laughs> you'd say Sting and Goldberg. There you go. I like it. There you Next. go, Fernando. Next. Yeah. Kurt Zamora is up and he says, is Undertaker's versatility against different types of opponents a little bit underrated? Matches like this hardcore match with RVD and ladder matches against Jeff Hardy show he could really go into any situation and any opponent. Brilliant performer. Brilliant performer. Uh, he went from becoming, uh, uh, he's, he should have been simply, and he got that way at the end. Uh, I thought an attraction guy, he was an Andre. You see him, the less you see him, the better, the more marketable and the more valuable he is. Uh, but, uh, takers multi-talented. He's got a great head for the business and somebody like him could evaluate a Jeff Hardy and, or, or look at this hardcore match with RVD and, and come up with a plan that he thought was going to work for, to accomplish what the, what the booker, I uh, events wanted at the end of the night. As far as going over or whatever the case may be. So, uh, no, he, he's very underrated now. It's good. It's a good question. Actually. Yeah. He's cause everything else he's so strong at, uh, presence. So awesome. He's, uh, you could easily overlook that. And I think Kurt makes a good point. Mike is up next. And he says, since we hear over and over that Vince is in the star making business and given recent releases of some big names and characters. Why do you think he strapped the rocket to Chris Jericho? Really, Mike? Mike, you okay? Mike, 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 Mike. Are you shitting me? He's a talented guy. He was young. He was durable. He's still doing this shit. Uh, I don't even, that, that, that's a silly question. I'm glad you listen. And I'm glad that you sent a question in, but. Jericho got the rocket ship strapped to him because everybody involved in the process felt like he was the man for that job at that particular time to have a cocky undersized heel be the, the, the top dog, the big rooster in the, in the hand and the, in the barnyard is, is a no brainer. Uh, so, and we needed heels and we needed, we needed wrestling heels and we need heels that could brawl. And nobody can convince me that Jericho doesn't have amazing skills in both those areas. Promos, creative, always changing his game up, adding things. We see it today. We're talking 20 years ago and he's a lot younger. So uh, to me, it's no, it was a no brainer. I'm right. a, and it sounds, and I am very loyal to Chris and I still am, but I'm loyal to all the guys I signed. You know, they all know I get phone calls. I get guys needing things and I never say no. Now that, that don't mean for all you guys I signed, you could call me and say, Jerry, I need to borrow our grant. <laughs> That's all <laughs> this means by the way, <laughs> but they all, but in reality and to be serious, if they, if they were in, in that situation, uh, they know I'd come through. That's right. You'd at least give them 500. All right. Francis <laughs> Ryasak is up next. Our last question of the week. He said, would you have the two tournament matches at the beginning instead of near the end of the pay-per-view? Well, that's a good question. Programming wise, it would have worked. Uh, but I, I, I like the way the, the show ended quite frankly. I don't know what else we would have closed with that would, have, that would have, uh, you know, that the audience would have bought in for, especially with all the hype of what Vince's meant, what it was going to be. So I, th I kind of think I'd keep the plan as it were it was, but it would, uh, would, if they started off first and then had the final, final match at the end of the night, would that work? Probably, probably would have, I just want to keep the package together. 
they wanted people to say things like you said earlier, Jericho just worked X number of minutes here and an X number of minutes here gets to the arguably the two greatest pro wrestlers active in the world that day. So, uh, but it's, it's an interesting question, but I, 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 I can see me amending it, but, uh, but I, I kind of like the way that it ended because it built drama. How long can Jericho last? You know, whatever the case may be. So I was cool with it. Well, listen, thank you to all those of you that participated in sending questions, the good, the bad, and the ugly. We appreciate all of them. And listen, JR, I don't know yep. if you knew this or not, but in 2022, you got to be a member of adfreeshows.com if you want to submit questions to all the podcasts uh, on the Conrad Thompson Network. So if you're not already, check out adfreeshows.com and make sure that you are submitting questions to shows like Grilling JR and getting your answers to your questions uh, beginning with next year's topics. Jim, next week, the discussion is all about Stone Cold Steve Austin's 1995 and 96. It's the debut of the Ringmaster. How we got to the WWF, the slow start, and then Austin 316. And by God, we're off to the races. <laughs> yeah, okay. I'm sure you're looking forward to talking about your longtime friend, Stone Cold. Yeah, a lot of stories there. A lot of stories. A lot of challenging times, you know, uh, Steve's not always the guy that was easily kept happy because he was such a perfectionist and, uh, he knew exactly what he envisioned that character of stone cold was going to be, how it was going to evolve. Where were we, where were we headed here? And, uh, but that, you know, he didn't trust a lot of people. DTA is real. Don't trust anybody. That's not a, that's not a t-shirt. It may be, but it's a, uh, it, 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 that's a lot of, that's how he believes a lot of times he's been burned here, there, and yon, and he's just not gonna, he's, he's just not going to be taken advantage of in his mind. And sometimes he was his own worst enemy. We'll talk about that. He very stone cold is the most complex athlete that I ever worked with. And that covers a lot of hall of fame guys, millionaire guys, and big star guys and all mm. those things. Well, he was, uh, yeah, he was, so and there's a lot of stories go along with that. So we'll, we'll get that working out and, and it'll be good. It'll be a fun show to talk about. Cause I enjoy talking about him and, and I don't know that anybody on earth knows more about him than me. JR, that's going to be one not to miss. It'll be the December 23rd episode, two days away from Christmas. Talk about yeah. an early Christmas gift. Nothing better than a little JR talking Stone Cold Steve Austin. So make sure you stay, stick around for that. JR, talk about jrsbbq.com. We only have a few more days until the big Christmas holiday. Yeah, you got to potty or get off the pot, as they say in Oklahoma. And uh, according to the delivery times and all that stuff. Uh, but I, as I said at the very beginning of the show, we're working every day, mm. even me and my, uh, less than uh, athletic state, uh, shall we say, uh, is, uh, cause I don't like getting up walking around. My foot starts throbbing and it's just a, a tough time right now, but I'm signing books and, and, uh, we got great stocking stuffers. We got boxes, gift boxes that have all these different items in it at different price points. Uh, and so it's all at jrsbbq.com. Uh, and we're going to do all we can. Our customer service is, is phenomenal. And so, you know, we can't even all the while we can't guarantee a shipping delivery because we're not the post office or not FedEx or wherever it may be. Uh, but we can get it ready to go on time. And so we're going to do our end. But yeah. I wish you'd check it out. You know, even a, a, a bottle of seasoning. And a stocking is a pretty cool little stocking stuffer for a wrestling fan. One of those uh, Moscow mule glasses that are all engraved, pretty cool gift. Uh, and, and we just got so many different things and different packages and different price points, uh, that I hope that you'll give us a shot. And I, it always makes me feel good, especially when I, when we send out packages and then the recipient of those packages, send us pictures of what they got on Twitter or whatever. Mm. It's just cool seeing my ugly mug on somebody's table at the holidays. 
and it's always grilling season. If you don't believe me, just ask Connie. Where the hell is Conrad? I just noticed he wasn't here today. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> where is that? Where are those cheeks? Oh, those big cheeks. Uh, <laughs> so he's, uh, he's just getting ready for that Alabama, uh, Cincinnati game. Oh, there you go. He loves that. I'm happy for him. I'm happy for my Sooners. We got a new head coach who's, and uh, who I was a great friend uh, and I love Brent Venables. Good guy. He'll do real well there. He really will. And then they got the OC from, uh, Mississippi, uh, and he played football at OU and got a medical red shirt, got hurt. He's an offensive lineman, but he's evolved into one of the best offensive coordinators in the country. He's so good an offensive coordinator that he was called in plays in Mississippi and not Lane Kiffin. Mm. So that's, that's pretty cool. So uh, things are good. See, now I focused on those things, Paul, and I, and that keeps my mind off all this other bullshit. That's good, man. That's what you got to do. That's what you got to do. So, uh, I'm, uh, excited about, uh, the future and I'm excited about getting back into at work with a renewed vigor and vim and full of piss of vinegar, as they say, and, and going back and having some fun. I, there are a few times that I look at something and, and with reluctance that I didn't get to call it. And it's not because Excalibur and Tony Schiavone can't get the job done. They can, that's obvious. They did a great job, but I really am uh, remiss that I didn't get to call, uh, my man, uh, hangman page, uh, de defending against, uh, Daniel, uh, Brian Daniel, Anderson. Daniel Bryan. Let my family save your family some cash. You don't need perfect credit. You don't need money out of your pocket, but we will save you money. It's not a matter if it's a matter of how much save with Conrad.com. Yeah. Or Brian Danielson, any name you want to say, you'll know who he is. And he listens to those kicks. <laughs> that's right. You can hear the kicks. So I, I'm, I, that's the first time in a long time. I've just thought about it because Tony Khan laid that match out there early. So people could plan to watch it. And I've been thinking about it ever since I heard the announcement. Mm. So I, I'm, I'm missing out on that one, but, uh, we'll make up for it. We'll make that up for it. Cause I got a feeling that no matter what happens on dynamite this week, it won't be the last time those two hombres uh, square off in the town square could be just getting started, man. That's right. You never know. Well, listen, JR, this has been, as always a pleasure to work with you and talk with you. I really enjoy, uh, doing this with you, man. I can't, can't say it enough. Adfreeshows.com. Check us out early ad free bonus material. JR and I hope to do a bonus show together before the end of the year. We'll talk about that a little bit after we hang up here together, but yeah. man, check us out adfreeshows.com. JR, this has been a lot of fun and I uh, appreciate your time today. Oh, I appreciate you, Paul stepping in for uh, Connie Conrad's got some, his bit mortgage businesses and rightfully so, because they have a great company and do a great service. I've got buddies of mine that have bought homes through Conrad's company. And, uh, you know, I think my buddy, uh, Raphael Morphy, ah, yeah, works, uh, works with uh, us at AEW, one of my best buddies. He's been a big, big help in my convalescence. I can tell you that. And he didn't have to, he spent time here when he could have been home with his son and his wife and it is the holidays, but he spent time. He spent some time down here to help me get around and, uh, but little did we know that I thought this thing, like I said earlier, the psychology I had, the psychology I had was that, well, it's going to get better through this process. Well, it's not going to get better through the process. It's going to get better when we stop the process and they can't stop the process until they do what they believe is enough doses, enough treatments to kill this cancer. That's right. So, uh, you know, I'm a big, big fan of, uh, old Raphael and he's done a great job. A lot, a lot of guys have. But, uh, I don't know where we were in our conversation, but That's I, okay. I, you were just talking I, about how busy Conrad is the mortgage company. And oh yeah. And, it's, and he's doing great. And I'm so proud yeah. of him, you know, yeah. uh, he's doing good. And, uh, he's invited me to come down for new year's Eve. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to make that because I got a vision. I might see Dave Silva <laughs> in a, in a male diaper shitting himself, uh, or where, or he could be wearing a, a big old king size depends with one of Conrad's belts around his waist. Oh my God. That How would need a that? belt extender. Yeah. For Dave. 
<laughs> I'm not going to make it either. I was invited, but we can't make it. It's it, it's you know that time of year uh, for us too. But man, listen, Jr. 2022. I want to hang out with you. We got to get together. But, but that's what Conrad does. Yeah, he invites all his buddies. <laughs> Here we go. In the in the in the whole goddamn uh, in, the, in the method of uh, being a, a good humanitarian, right, and a nice Christian thing to do, <laughs> love thy neighbor. Uh, and he knows that nobody, everybody can't come. That's right. He knows what he's doing. He knows exactly. He's protecting himself. He looks like a champion and he's got a beautiful home and I would love to go. I'm sure the food and the booze would be great, but, uh, I'm, probably yeah. first class, you know, but it's just like the roughest time of the year with the most expensive airline tickets and everything else. It's and connecting um, in Atlanta. <laughs> you want to go through Atlanta during the holidays? I don't. <laughs> My fat ass is going to sit right in there on that couch oh, this is and great. watch all the football I can consume. That's right. Uh, so in any event, good I, times. Good. I, I, I enjoyed working with you, Paul. We had, we had fun today and I hope everybody enjoyed the show. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not as full of P and B cause I got up really early this morning and did my treatment. I go right back tomorrow morning and right back on Friday morning, but we're getting there. So we, we can, we're turning the curve and I really do appreciate everybody's uh, support. It's, it's uh, I can't tell you how much it means to go on Twitter or some of those Facebook or whatever and see, uh, people's thoughts and how they share their feelings. And I think that's true. I, I got a, yeah. a, something the other day that, cause I've been so open and maybe too much for some people's taste. I don't know on my condition and the house progressing and where we are just information, uh, that this guy says, uh, he sends me a tweet. It's got his little boy in it. His little boy's been diagnosed with cancer. Mm. He said that because you've been so open about explaining your situation and how you're approaching it, it's been an uplifting message for my son. Wow. So, you know, you don't think about things like that. That's right. Uh, uh, and that's, uh, that's I think cool, the kids man. like 10 or 12, Shh. but in any event, I, I appreciate those, uh, those good, good well wishes. They're cool. And, uh, can't do enough nice things for people. I'll tell you us, us that sometimes need a little boost. Really appreciate it. Well, Jr. we love you, man. We're, we're all in your corner. We're cheering for you. And, uh, we're all in the stands as you're in the fight of your life right now. And right now it is. And, uh, we're all in the stands. You're our hero. You're the face. You're the baby face. And we're cheering hard <laughs> for you yeah. big time to put it. What, in a, what a baby face. <laughs> I got to think of some, I got to think of some t-shirt, uh, designs, you know, I thought of something cause it's going to happen. You know, uh, Jr. whip cancer's ass. There you go. That might be a nice shirt. Yep. Not, but I just kick cancer's ass or yeah, we'll come up yeah. with something. Maybe people will tweet some, some ideas. Yeah. Oh, they always do. They're brilliant. Uh, they have ideas. I love it. Some of the booking ideas are a little stupid, but nonetheless, I'm kidding. <laughs> Uh, why well, did Chris Jericho get the rocket ship tied to him? I love it. I knew you were going to say it. Yeah. I don't mind. Come on. Come on. You're, now. Just, you're, he's looking, you're looking for something, bro. It's not Dallas page, by the way, congratulations to DDP for getting married recently. And, uh, that's kind of neat. Uh, the world's the world's greatest overachiever in pro wrestling. And I mean that in a very good way, actually. So congratulations to DDP and I can ramble on all night. It's the medication, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I, I need to move to my living room now yeah. and eat your dinner and watch AEW. Yeah. JR, her name's Paige. So is it Paige Page? Is that what the name is now? I, I don't know. <laughs> okay. But that's be, true. Yeah. And his name is Paige Falkenberg. Right. So, yeah. So there you go. There's two page Falkenbergs. Yeah. Then this on show's the going to hell real quick. It has. Let's get we out have of here. Gone down. Let's cut it. Yeah. We're done. Get... Listen, thank you all for joining us. This has been an absolute blast. Hopefully you enjoyed the last uh, little bit of JR and I's dialogue. This is what it's like before we hit record. So this is a little peek behind the curtain. We thank all of you for listening and please come back next week for some stone cold Steve Austin with the voice of wrestling. Jim Ross. We'll see you next time on grilling. JR and eat more barbecue for God's sakes. Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson. Thanks for checking out the podcast here on YouTube. Be sure to hit the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you get a notice anytime we upload some new content. And go save yourself some money right now. If you're in a 30 year loan or you have credit card debt, it's not a matter of if I can save you money, it's a matter of how much. Find out right now for free at savewithconrad.com.